finished my sixth year as president, so I always know this is my seventh trip to see you, and I always <laughs> look forward to it. Um, our support from the town of Weston goes back to the beginning of the Interfaith Housing Association, Westport Weston Inc. Um, by 2002, the town had given us a grant of $12,222. And I found it interesting. I was just looking uh, at budgets and everything. And in 2002, that was just about 1% of our total budget. And I was a banker before, and, and I really love not to have to rely on government support. But I was pleased to see that uh, in two, it went up 3% every year from 2002 to 2008. And in 2008, it reached $14,853. And with that unpleasantness that happened around about 2008, it stayed the same, and it's been the same ever since. And that represents now a little less than half percent of our budget. So we're kind of inflating our way out of government support, which I find very satisfying. Uh, and it's kind of unusual for a, uh, an organization like ours, which represents the really generous community that we live in. We're about 70% privately funded, which is very unusual for a homeless organization because most of them are in big cities and they have trouble uh, funding themselves. Um, the support that we seek from the town of Weston is in uh, addition to the support of 72 Westport, Weston family, churches, and clubs who donated over $50,000 to Homes of Hope in 2015. Um, I know that Weston contributes to the fabric of our operations uh, with Norfield, Emanuel, and Weston Kiwanis among the 65 families, groups, congregations, and institutions that serve lunches and dinners at our Gillespie Center uh, in the community kitchen every year. So that it really does bring uh, a lot of Weston residents down to the Gillespie Center and to the Backrack community. Uh, community kitchens greatly supported, and I always like to give a shout out to Peter's Weston Market and Jim McGee, who are just fantastic and really provide so many of the lunches to the organization. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. And then I also like to mention Peg Taylor, who was a former Weston Teacher of the Year, who for 23 years, I think it was, brought um, three classes every year to the Gillespie Center to serve lunch. And if there's any Western teacher uh, on TV that's watching who would like to take over that mantle, I'm still looking for it because it was a great experience for the middle schoolers and for um, and for the residents to see the community kind of help them out. So that was that was great. Um, and then last but not least, three of your residents and former residents have shoot back Jeff Byrne and Priest Schramm are on our board, and so they add greatly to the support that we get. Um, and then to reiterate the, some of the numbers that I did send you, uh, it, is, it is fairly obvious that over the last couple of years, the use of our facilities by West Knights has dropped uh, significantly. Uh, from 2005 to 2010, only our single emergency shelters were used by West Knights. Um, and we. Pardon me? Only single emergency shelter. So Gillespie right. Center and Hoskins Place, the men's single the women's shelter women's and the women's mm -hmm. single shelter. But there are some that take their meals there every, every yeah. day. And what your Western residents. In fact, as I, I interviewed her the last time I was serving her, and she's as sharp as can be when she, had, when she wants to be. But she's bipolar and we just never know what's going on. She lives outside, she lives in the shed. Police know where she is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you'll see her around Westport quite often. She's blonde and walks away decided. And she's very, she's, uh, she's grew up here. You know, she grew up in Westport. And uh, she's now probably in her early 60s. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, right. But, um, but she comes for her meals. So uh, the other thing that Jeff didn't mention, of course, is our new acquisition. Yes. Well, Before we get to that, can, just, can, can I just follow up on that, that question? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so the residents who are in Gillespie since 2010 have not been anyone from Weston. No, no, no. Sorry. Okay. I didn't yeah, 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 yeah. So I, just from 2005 to 2009, there were four residents, Weston residents, in Gillespie Center or Austin's Place, okay. single men or women. In 2010 and 2011, there were 10 and 8. And 
we couldn't imagine why that was even back in 2010 and 2011, but it was clearly economically driven in the unpleasantness that was kind of taking hold there. So in many cases, it's a mental health issue that brings people to our shelter. I think in, in with regard to Weston, it's an economic thing, when it happens, when there are really severe problems. So, so and, natural, and, so and, right, and then, so in 2010, we had the first resident come to our backpack community, the first single mother with children. So that's I, I, that's, I was getting, keeping it single individuals, and then in 2010, we had a woman come to backpack, and she was there for close to a year, and then moved out to a permanent housing situation where she's doing fine, but that was um, a great success. And then uh, since 2012, we've had two, two, one, and one. So last year we had only one resident. Uh, the one differenti differentiating factor about Western residents at the shelters in Westport is they tend to stay longer than the average sort of 55 days. And that seems to be in part because A, they're well behaved so they don't get kicked out, uh, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, B, uh, they have a plan, so they're, they're economic, they're working on some way to find permanent housing, so they don't just disappear in the middle of the night as some, some folks do. So, uh, you know, we might only have one in a whole year, but we hang on to that person to make sure that they have a successful outcome. Um, the part of the program is to get them out of the shelters and get them into permanent supportive housing or permanent housing. The, with the support of housing and we're involved with them on a constant basis. Um, there are a number of programs where we're involved just with the council. Um, we're not involved with the housing. But um, right now we're housing at least 100. With children, how many children do we have now? About 35. 35 children, they go to the Westport schools. Um, and you know, the, one of the things is you're not seeing the homeless out on the streets. You know? We grab, it's a new program that was inst instituted last year. And uh, we take them right off the street. We used to, used to place them in a shelter somewhere in Fairfield Camp. And today, we take them right off the street and we try to get them housing. And we have a person that's all she does is look for housing. And today, it's Bridgeport more than Norwalk because Norwalk's prices have gone up as far as running is concerned. We bought a house three years ago or two years ago yeah. uh, to, in Norwalk to house a couple of families. Uh, we're constantly looking for properties to acquire, to increase our housing capacity. But even with that, um, we've been able to get them into, into housing and into permanent housing. And so then we do the counseling. So it isn't always that we're doing the housing, but we are finding the housing and it's hard, because the landlords often don't want this type of person. And we've convinced them that we're counseling them and we're monitoring them, and they're good tenants. So that's, that's where we are. But now we've even reached even further, and we've joined, and we've uh, merged with another organization, which I'll let Jeff talk about. Right, so Project Return has been uh, in Westport on North Campo Road, coincidentally, since 1983 as well. And for the until just this past year, it has been a house for seven high school girls, 14 to 18 year olds, who have gone to Staples High. They come from other, uh, all over, but um, they go to Staples. And they have, uh, it's been a home for girls who couldn't live at home, basically. Or, or the, and typically referred by the Department of Children and Families. And this year, because of the state cutbacks, they, the Department of Children and Families has decided that all girls, high school girls, should go to foster homes, not to group homes. So they cut their funding, and kind of as a lifeline, uh, we are going to merge. So there'll be a program of Homes of Hope, and rather than 14 to 18-year-old girls, they'll be looking after 18 to 24-year-old girls because the state, and we agree, the state believes that there are a number of 18 to 24-year-old girls and boys out there who are couch surfing, who don't want to go to a homeless shelter in downtown Westport with 50-year-old women uh, surrounding them. They want to stay with their friends. And if you have a house that is 18 to 24-year-olds only, you'll be able to attract them to come. 
seek the, the assistance they need for life skills, for education, and we're very excited about adding those actually eight beds to the program um, in a slightly um, more, uh, slightly older group of, of women, but it's going to be a really terrific program. So, uh, and is that funded uh, by the state primarily? That will all be private funding. No state right. funding. No. We're sort of taking it on, and uh, there have been some heated board discussions about the risk associated therewith. That's but, right. uh, but it's going to be a it's going to be a really terrific thing, I think, and it's meant to prove that this is something that's needed, and so that should be uh, exciting, and it adds a bed to our program. So. That's going to be very interesting. The one uh, just and, one oh, yeah. question: now, What's the referral process for that? There, that's perfect timing because uh, in the last two years, the state has gotten very, actually HUD has gotten very strong about the two one one program. So, if um, Charlene Chang Hillman calls us and says we have a family that's in, in need, uh, and, and I say that because this happened in Wilton. Uh, two weeks ago, their, their Charlene equivalent called up Kathy Pierce, said I have a family in need who needs to go into the background community. And we said, everybody has to call 211 to get registered in the homeless system. You've got to call 211. You've got to be interviewed for your homelessness, your, your needs, your um, medical and mental health situation. And you're given a vulnerability index and you're Basically, it's a good way to keep track of homeless people and make sure that we can help them. Um, but it's very um, uh, unbiased. You know, you, you've got to, it, it, you just go on a waiting list. So, but but we talk. You know, we, we view that we have to support the communities that support us. So Wilton called, and and we said, this is what you do: have the person call two one one, go to Gillespie Center, get an interview. She goes right on the waiting list. And if she fits in the back rack, we have to be very fair and we can't jump in and cues, but by going to, and the timing is right, we can make sure that we take care of Wilton as we would Westport and Western. Um, and the woman, uh, that was about three weeks ago, and the woman's now in the back rack community. Was so, that children? Huh? How many children? Uh, two. Two. I forget their ages. But, so, but, the, but it's a very, um, strict process, fair housing, fair rent, all those things. Uh, we have to be very careful about not jumping queues, which is why I can't say if a Western person shows up, they'll get a bed because we're a small agency, we don't have that many beds. But we'll, 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 we try really hard. But we try hard to, to arrange it. Yeah, yeah. Would, would, that be, would that be true for this in facility as well? Yes. Oh, sure. And then the other part is that um, what we're doing this year alone uh, with the town of Westport, when they tore down the trailer park and built new homes there, we've got 10 units. And so we, and the story is that the gentleman, the first one we put in there was a gentleman who was in a wheelchair, who had a beard down to here and hair down to here, and we put him in there, and the next thing you know, he got a haircut and a shave, and he's like a different human being. He's just changed his personality, and and of course, it's a brand new place, and it's you know you feel good, and it's right down close road. When you are dealing with people, are you able to determine whether they have any substance abuse problems? Yes, yeah, sure. And they usually do, actually, or often do. And that's one of the first things we try to do is get them into some sort of detox rehab, and that's part of the case management. Everybody who comes into any of our shelters or permanent housing gets a. Case, work, case worker who has a master's in social work and refers them to whatever the needs are that they might have. And often, uh, mental health is attached to substance abuse because it's kind of self-medication that's gotten out of control. So many of our folks start off in some sort of rehab type situation for their alcohol and drugs. But um, unless they're in treatment, they can't stay in shelter. So that's part of the program. Do you do any test we do testing? Oh yeah, right. we do spot testing. That's good. And we also have um, the medical comes in. The, there's a bus out of the Norwalk Health District that comes every Tuesday morning. Uh, 
and it took us a year to convince them to come, but uh, they, they come and sit by the Gillespie Center on Tuesday mornings, and it's healthcare for everybody in the, in the, uh, in the shelter, but most importantly, this woman that uh, Hal was referring to, who lives out truly in a shed, even in the middle of winter, she really kind of a classy lady, grew up in Weston, mm -hmm. and uh, she has never gone to a doctor before, and she's not going to the bus, so that is kind of one of the big successes of the bus. And at some point, she might even come inside, but you know, you, know, you, have to want, you have to want to, you know, but we try. It's, it's hard because you can't categorize people. Uh, it's amazing who these people are. It's a lot of them are well-educated, have graduate degrees, uh, circumstances. You have an automobile accident, can't work anymore, and all of a sudden, all their money's gone, just on medication. So uh, they're living the life like a lot of our people in this country, and uh, fortunately, we're able to, to help. Could you briefly elaborate on the benefits of a program like Homes, Homes with Hope versus going to sort of the institutional system and, and the benefits of being in a facility like yours over you know, the alternative? Well, there there aren't a lot of alternatives. I think that's one of the one of the problems. You know, the reason every, all these organizations started in 1983 was because uh, the federal government stopped funding the state governments, and they had to close a lot of mental health institutions. Now, there were a lot of people in mental health institutions that shouldn't have been there, so it was a good call in a lot of ways. But it released a lot of people, and a lot of them ended up in these the uh, church school places at Sokotuk and Temple Israel, and these, the, the uh, heads of the House of Worship got together and said, what are we gonna do? And they got a shelter. Um, so it really is, but from, from a societal, governmental point of view, again, looking at the way I look at budgets, it's a great thing because it's hugely expensive to the state to run mental institutions. And if you can give a housing voucher for $1,500 for one bedroom apartment, even in this, pretty wealthy area, uh, that's much cheaper than 80,000 for a mental health institution or something. So so there aren't really any, uh, uh, I mean, the alternatives are the street, right, prison, that's what I'm talking about. prison. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, we're, all, all the people in your system are people who are now not walking in the streets of Norwalk, Wilton, right, West correct. Port and Weston. And, and, and the people that you do see, I saw one today on I-95 exit. Uh, 17. 17. He drives me crazy, so don't give him money. He can get anything he wants at our place, and that he's taking money from like. Oh, right. But right. understand, okay. Fairfield Hills was closed. Yeah. Southport was home was closed. A lot of Western residents had children in there that were uh, special ed. Mm -hmm. uh, so they throw them out. You know, families either take care of them or throw them out on the streets. And, and while the numbers are small, would it be fair to categorize homes? with hope as, as one of our main safety nets for people who end up in that situation for Weston. We're the only one around. There's only one, you know, the big cities have shelters, but you name the towns in Fairfield County, Greenwich, New Canaan, Darien, they don't have shelters. Fairfield does, but that's it. So we are it. I've been waiting to be corrected. I've made this statement many times that there are only four shelters like Homes of Hope in suburban affluent America. And they're in Fairfield, coincidentally, Operation Hope's great organization. Uh, us, Petaluma, California, and Reston, Virginia. And I would love to know if there are any others because I'd like to talk to people who run them. But I don't think they are. I think uh, cities tend, or towns tend to say, go to the big city which can barely educate their children, let alone take care of suburban homeless people. And actually, if you look at the statistics now, um, the, amount, the number of veterans that are homeless now, zero in Fairfield County. Um, in Connecticut. In yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. And really that goes the Connecticut. same for this pro new program where we're taking them off the street. And we're working collaboratively with, was it from Stanford on up? Uh -huh. So with all the organizations there, and they're actually funding one of our employees who does a lot of the counseling. So we're actually, in, we know who they are, we've talked to these people, and we're working with them to get them off the street. But not just to get them off the street, but get them to get them to get them You know, never say never, uh, knock on wood every time I say this, but we've had a wonderful record for, for, for 30.
32 years, 33 years. Um, I, I think it's a whole lot better to know who your folks are in town with mental illness than to ignore them. And I think we've got a really good feel in the towns we serve for who, through, the, through their human services directors, as much as anything, uh, of who the, the people are who might be troublemakers. There's, even when you know who they are, there's so much you can do with them. How do you distinguish between mental illness and a criminal? Uh, I mean, I, I, that's what I'm trying to say. That, I know, and dangerous. I mean, we don't, we don't have, have, and that's criminal. Well, we don't interview them in terms of their record, but we do interview them on the basis of why are you here and what seems to be the problem. And when you get to the root of the problem, you deal with the problem. You know, it's a, it's a very fortunate thing that we the Gillespie Center, which is kind of the main input <laughs> for our place, is right across the street from the police station. So there's a little bit of self-selection that goes on in terms of who comes into the Gillespie Center. But, uh, and, and we have a great relationship with the police. In fact, um, in January every year, there is a point in time count of homeless people throughout the country. And we, we go out at midnight and look around for people on the streets. And uh, I know that in, in late January, early February, we called the Weston police just to see, is there anybody outside that you know of? There wasn't. Uh, Westport, we knew there were a couple others. I think there was one at Wilton. Um, and then lots of normal. But um, so, you know, we have these contacts with people in the police departments and in the town agencies. And it's a good network. It's, it really is a good caring network that if there's going to be a problem, at least we have some idea. School counselors are a great way to get to know people who might be identified. And if they do, then you get them into some sort of treatment before they become criminals. And, and if you can do that, that is the answer to all of the problems. It's just very hard to make that happen. No, I'm Good enough for the questions. Thank you. Well, these are, I guess, great questions. It's all up. I do have more questions sure. today because I think now to duplicate services among one community and another community came to my attention that Norwalk does not have a social services department. That's right. So we're, we're, we're talking here about uh, a partnership between private and public um, blending funds so that we can serve the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. If you are we duplicating, you already answered that question. We're not duplicating anything that that's being done elsewhere. Are we doing something that is not being offered uh, that might be extended to other communities with a reciprocal we're sort of, benefit? We're sort of the model. And in many instances, they come to us for advice. And we've been working with Stanford for a long time and a couple of other organizations. Uh, but we are working collaboratively now with social services in these towns, and Norwalk is working with us. Um, the shelter in Norwalk works with us. Uh, frankly, a lot of the people who go to the shelter there want to come to us. <laughs> so uh, we offer much you better. You take donations, I, I understand, for the uh, items for the household. And oh, yeah. Extra, extra, yeah, extra kitchen equipment yep, yep. and stuff like that. Toiletries from all those hotels. Right now, if you want to know, know, right now we're short. I just put in a plate. We're short of plates right now. Plates? We need plates. plates. Dinner plates. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got any old dinner plates? I'll somewhere? spread the word out. <laughs> we can use dinner plates. And House Point is a good one. We are part of the Norwalk Housing First Collaborative, and that includes the Open Door Shelter in Norwalk, Fair Family and Children's Agency, and Mid Fairfield AIDS Project, which are the four agencies that provide supportive housing. And Six years ago, I called up a couple of the heads of these agencies and they wouldn't return my call. It was just very isolated. Now we meet every other week to talk about every chronically homeless person, which is someone with a mental health diagnosis and has been homeless uh, for a period of time. And we have identified everybody. There's another meeting with among case managers who talk about everybody and identify their problems and try to cross-coordinate needs among agencies. So in fact, there's a really big effort not to duplicate, but to make sure that, um, you know, we can't afford to hire psychotherapists. But if somebody really needs a psychotherapist, there's an agency out there that has those people on staff that can be really useful. So. The, 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 if I can make a recommendation to you, 
uh, are you essentially called the workplace? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. worried that they have re-entry yep. into the job market. Americans yep. also is tremendously helpful. Um, they are international. And got a great clinic not, in Norwalk. Mercury. got a great clinic in Norwalk. But one thing people do not know is that children who are here who may not have access to any kind of medical insurance and want to get enrolled in school for the first day of school, they can go to Americans and they will get their uh, medical tests there because they can't bring their children to the schools who might be bringing in, you know, something from some other country. Um, Americans will do the do that. So oh, they're great coming into our schools. They're all over the country, right? Clinics. They're all over the clinics. And of course, at a moment's notice, they're in emergency places all over the world. The scary part is that some of those places are no longer safe. Where they at? Well, yeah. <laughs> we just bought another hospital in Syria. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. And the Salvation Army, is that in our area? Yeah, there's a Salvation Army in, in Wilton and in uh, Norwalk. Yeah. But nobody's doing what we do. That's the main thing. Okay. Chris? Yeah. You know, I've talked to, to uh, Colin and the group before. I've been over there. I think it's a wonderful organization. You know, I've actually historically worked in halfway houses and, and other institutions like that. And yours was very impressive. The staff and the clientele. Um, I'll, I'll, the only thing I was sort of curious about, and this isn't necessarily related to this, but you, you alluded to it, but what's the change in terms of the mix of economic versus clinical populations? I, I, you implied that the uh, economic numbers had gone way down, <coughs> which would be clinical as well. Total surmise on my part. I, I, can't, I can't figure out why we had 10 people from West End that shelter in 2009. 2010 and eight in 2011, and then on average four before that and two after it. Um, so it just is hard to explain other than a kind of a really severe economic thing, which we were going through in those West couple of years. Uh, our numbers in social services was taking care of over 100 families mm -hmm. in those, in, during that period of time. Because people have left, is what Charlene said. Well, they can't, they they've sold their houses. The situation got so critically bad for them. And it was kind of right as I was that's not getting there, so I didn't, well, didn't really study it too hard. So I'm not sure. You know, again, this is a very expensive area to live in. And in many cases, it's better that they find a place that's more affordable. It's hard to say that to somebody, but you know, you live with, within your means if you can. If they can't, you, you make adjustments. And that's what people are doing. So I don't. No, no, the answer is no, really. Part of that is absolutely true. For sure. sure. There's, there's more, in the real world, there's more complicated there are always circumstances. There. The other question it's nobody asks. People can do the right thing all through their lives and end up yeah. homeless. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to bring one thing up to nobody asks, and it's that um, we have no major step other than our MSWs. Right. Um, Jeff is the president. Uh, Audrey is uh, in charge of the program and operations. operations. And we have one that writes grants. She's been with us a long time. And the secretary. And that's it. And a finance. And a finance. Part time. Part time. So we run very lean. And we have a wonderful, wonderful group of women that are our Women and men that are our MSWs. And we do a And remember, these people are in the shelter 24 hours a day. We don't let them stay there all day, but we have staff there. But the, the, my point was almost a, a, a great majority of the people in the shelter and in, well, the permanent supportive housing, by definition, have a mental health issue. And it's often under control, it's very controllable, but it's also easy to get out of control if you're not looked after by a, a caseworker and who's up to speed on what you're doing with your medication or whatever. And so uh, to see those numbers, I don't think there were 10 folks from Weston in 2010 who were in the shelter because they had mental health issues. I just assumed that there was some economic. Well, strike. you see changes in numbers and you tie it into something going on in the 
the larger yes. economic scheme, it's, it's a fair assumption yes. that's going yeah. on. Yeah. But good to go there. Just a guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had a situation that you're asking for a certain amount of money, and we're asking the same amount. Of you're asking the same amount. Been for the last what, five years. Uh, no. You're aware if we did that, it would essentially not allow us to to supply and support to any other person that comes or organization that comes to request. Oh. And, and I, I didn't realize that. I, I just kind of we, did the same. We have a terrific budget. Uh, representative here, Tom, would you explain how the uh, fund was reduced and what it is now? Well, the short answer is there was a fair amount of discussion and a different number was approved than was approved previously. I think it was like 5,000 or 10. I think it was five initially and then the, uh, and the, the, uh, the Board of Finance meeting it was taken down again. So it was 15 or something now? It's 15. Yeah. How much was it the year before? 25. 25. Yeah, that's what I thought. There was a lot of pressure uh, to reduce it now. And I said, okay, because we want to keep the budget new. Um, we thought this way on the state What was going on at the state level was going to impact us as well. So it was reduced by 5,000. I thought that was not unreasonable. By what? I, I volunteered. To reduce it by 5,000, the pressure came even further to reduce it more, and so it's a good time. We were sitting in there, we sitting there, we agreed that we could. So we have to go through supplemental? Well, actually, through the process, there was serious discussion about taking the number to zero and dealing with, with these requests totally as supplemental appropriation. Uh, the boards ended up deciding not to do that. This was like sort of a middle ground there was compromise position. Also, a, a discussion that would be fair to actually put it as an individual item if it was something that was going to be recurring annually anyway, as an individual budget item as opposed to in that, that kind of bucket. And again, there, there wasn't any uh, decision on it, and it was sort of decided to go forward. And if I remember the language that was sort of used, it would be well just as what the uh, budget would be, and we'd allocate it kind of on a first come first serve basis. I think that language was even used. And so that is lucky that came really. <laughs> well, except that I, 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 I don't find that appropriate. Okay. I, 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 I would object to that whoever is first online, mm. it comes in right away to the request. The automatically be the one that receives the request, mm. receives the funding. Uh, I think it's better. Well, first of all, there's, a, there's another question. Is it appropriate for the town to be in this business of picking charities? We've always had that discussion, and we've ended up giving $25,000 a year to charity. So it's not unusual, I, it's not different. I personally am not opposed to it, but it's other people's work. tax money. That's, I, and I just say, I, I like to think that this is kind of pay for service and that what we're doing is providing a service. But I do want to point out that, you know, we're neighbors and we're going to do whatever needs to happen. Yeah, but it's much all, it's all right. what what you really, I appreciate what yeah. you're saying. What you're really asking is, yeah, and what you're really asking is that we should wait until we get a Western resident and then send you a bill for the services. I mean, you know, That's we're not going to do that. We don't intend to do that. But at the same time, we have to pay our way too. And we're taking care of these people, and we don't mind taking care of them. It's, it's our job. And you do fund raising grant already, I'm sure. Lots of it. Lots of it. So, what would your answer to my? I'm not going to take it. Okay. It's up to you. Yeah, but what what is the what would be your answer to the dilemma that we have other people who would like to have some okay. funds from this uh, some? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's fair to ask that. Well, no, I. I'd make a suggestion. Yes, yes. I, I think we have a compelling story. I think we've been compelling and good partners for a long time. And it might make sense to take a number that you're comfortable with now, leave some, and judge the future ones against what you've seen tonight. And if there's anything left, come let us know and we'll be back and talk some more. There's another thing we could do. We could say it's a certain amount at this point and then Revisit it in six months. In other words, 
maintain a certain residual fund. Mm -hmm. Revisit and see <coughs> based on the need at that time and we prioritize and like letting and prioritizing the request of the We have to get our funds from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And it's not fair There's either. no question and that it's there. not fair it's to ask request. Westport to cover the bill for a lot of the services. And before. you can't plan if you don't know what the income's going to be. No, no. It's an impossible situation. I, I mean, I'm not yeah, just yeah. I'm having empathy for the situation that you're put in. I'm asking about the same time you have empathy for the situation that John Weston mm -hmm. yeah. is, is, is facing. At this All the time. Like, we build a budget, we don't you, anything. You, you had money cut from your school budget by the state, and the state did the same thing in Westport on a grander scale. Yeah. 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 Partially, it's about the same thing. Well, percentage wise, it was a lot less. Yeah. Well, for that initial number, I mean, we could come up with proportionals, I mean, I would like to do everything we can, but a, a fair way might be to do it proportionally. I guess our previous budget was 25000 and you guys uh, got about 60% uh, in my math okay on that? It was just under fifteen. Uh, that's right. right. So about 60%. So if we look at 60% of 15, you're the eight calculator. Nine thousand. Uh, nine. I, that's a thought. Since everyone's trying to come up with a number, but you know, and then revisit it depending on you know, we know that there's ongoing needs. So that's it, it's a hard thing because when we had 10 people going there, we were paying $15,000 for them, which is a bargain. I assume one person, $15,000 is going to be a bargain, so no, we're, it, it, right? So that we're, we're kind of it depends how long it, it, it depends yeah. how long it's yeah. and, and what services are required, sure. but um, in any event, certainly during those periods, it, it, it was a good financial deal. I don't weigh it that way, but just as a justification. So I'm just throwing that out there as a way to come up with a, a number that demonstrates we, although we've been impacted by states and you know taxpayers and, and having to cut back on a lot of things, we still have the same level of commitment to the cause and the idea and you know revisit it if we can do more, do more. My so it's I think that's a sensible approach. Uh, this is to me incredibly important resource to our uh, people in need, and uh, there's nothing else like it. I've been through it myself when I had to place someone, and yours was the only facility that was really available um, for a Western resident. So um, I think I, it's a little bit pay for services, but it's a little bit having that safety net for our residents. To the church. It's an insurance policy. Okay. So, uh, I, I would uh, be in favor of the same relative level of commitment that uh, we have before, given our circumstances. I would too. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring it down from other uh, point. No, I'd like to bring it down. One more concern that I had, and this is where I'd like to ask our budget director here. Um, we have a real problem, and you have the same problem. If the fiscal situation is so in flux up and down, then we never know what value anybody has anymore. Uh, we can't plan for the future. Mm -hmm. This is a, a local and a regional issue. Um, so my reaction of hesitancy has to do with we don't know what it's going to be like in six months. Because we don't know how, how things are going to happen. This, the state cut us on our uh, allocation of schools and then cut it again. And we have some left and we anticipate it consequence of the uh, mismanagement of the state. Fiscal policies is that we're going to have to guess what we're going to say. So this is the issue that I have for someone who fashions budgets. If there isn't some kind of a, um, a sense of a reasonable expectation that we know what the future holds, it works havoc with everybody's budgets. True. Ours, yours, and it's damaging to community at large. But we can't tell the people it's not coming. And you guys, <laughs> we got hit hard, but mental health from state cuts got hit even harder. Sure. You think we have? And the hospitals? Hospitals, mental health, all You think our budget hasn't been cut from Oh, I know it has. <laughs> Are you aware what they do with the hospital fund? It was a hospital fund that was a pool, and it was done voluntarily. And the idea was that according to the ability of the hospital to provide funds to this pool, these, this pool was developed so that it would then be distributed across the communities that need more assistance 
uh, based on need in the lack of insurance covering these people. And the state is now setting up the money for this poll, which already was doing on a private basis what we would want to be done by the state of our private initiative, which is to have a safety net for those who do come to a hospital mm -hmm. without insurance. But they're dealing and now the state they're is taking that money, and I don't know where to put it. <laughs> and we're dealing with dollars. Yeah. But it's an issue of how bad it is the policy. Well, it's, it's the state, and it's, and it's a fiscal policy of the state that's going to be problem, and that goes back for years. So mm -hmm. It's not just now, it's been happening for a long time. Now. 30 years. They kicked kick the can down the, down the street, and they've ignored it. So you know, to the towns have to do have to zero base it. budgeting, and we're all, you know, we have to have a balanced budget by the state law, and the state ignores it. What can I say? So, um, okay. Okay, what? Well. I'd like to have a motion. Uh, have a I would like to have a motion. I don't know what the amount should be. It's, I mean, the motion is definitely to allocate the funds for homes of health. Now the issue is the amount. Are we in agreement with the amount? I, I, you know, I think we all agree that we keep it proportional to what we can historically have done, and hopefully we can pump that up. And hopefully the situation will get better in the future. We and I think, and I think it may. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that. A hole in the line, you know, and hope for a better, better fiscal policy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what was the amount? 9,000. 9,000 units? Huh? Sure. 9,000 units. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll make a motion if I may. I move to update funds from the FY216 to 2017 community grants line to homes with hope for the amount of $9,000. Second. Um, any further discussion? No. All those in favor? All right. All right. Thank you very Unanimous. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good. Good. No budget concerns, too. Thank you. Most welcome. Thanks for the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Thank Thanks, Mel. 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 Thanks, It's up for the next discussion. Our next, next we were pressing it. It's a very soon <laughs> life. All right, so we just Regarding allocating funds from the FY 2016-17 community grants line to First Night Westport, Weston, and Blackton, and by Barbara Pearson, to test. I'll be talking about something a little more cheerful, <laughs> but I have to say that I do work with them because I do wear a different hat. I do a Make a Difference Day, which I mobilize thousands of volunteers every October to do a lot of projects with them. So I'm familiar with all the not-for-profits help them. But this is a different, this is more fun, um, and yet it does have a lesson to be learned. Um, where do you want me to start? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the invitation that I got to participate in the first night last year. Yeah, it was a wonderful. wonderful evening. I enjoyed it very much. And um, I really, I really think it's a worthy I hope you'll have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so too. So that was, that was fun on the light of the night. So why don't you tell us what your plans are for this? Yeah, well this year we're still in, we're still in the in the planning process. But I did bring last year's program guide so you could get an idea of what we actually do. So I could have one of these. And um, I even brought you last year's button <laughs> so you can see what we do. Um, this is the ticket to your the admission to all of the venues. Mm -hmm. And Every year, Migs Burroughs, our local graphic designer and 
now I guess the artist in residence at our library, um, designs a button. And I have his little gray shells working because I've been thinking at him. So he is still in the design phase of our next budget, uh, next button, which is the initial. But you can, the button's here for everyone. It's actually a reason why, just to look at your photographs, that you have it's great. Isn't it? Because um, the, um, there's a woman I know who has been designing this for us for a couple of years, and she's very talented. She's a friend, and um, she really does it basically for free. <laughs> but um, let me tell you a little bit about the event and what it means to the community. We are a completely volunteer organization, so we have no overhead. Um, every, every penny we raise goes to the production, which is uh, Paying the entertainers the, and the things that go along with that, the sound people and the insurance and any, any few, and, and some of the, uh, our constant contact because we do use mailings, um, things that keep it running. We have maintained the price of the button since its inception, I think. It is $10 uh, before December 15th and $15 after December 15th. And we think this is a very, very affordable price. And the reason we're able to maintain the price and welcome families who may have many children to come um, is because of our donors. And it's government sponsorship and private donations that we depend on because button sales do not cover the cost of this event. We have, originally there were, well there were many first nights in the state. But last year there were three. It was Hartford, uh, Danbury, and Westport. The day before um, New Year's Eve, Danbury said they were closing. They could not afford the event. We have maintained a very um, tight fiscal policy where we are able to make sure, ensure that going forward every year we have a little bit of a cushion because we deal with a variable called the weather and we don't know if we're going to get, you know, if, if we have uh, inclement weather, if people are going to show up, and we do depend on the sales to help us pay the bills. We've kept um, the budget tight. We've worked very closely with our performers, and they're very flexible, many of them, in terms of what they charge. But, you know, as the years progress, they, the costs do rise. Um, but we have um, attempted to find interesting, wonderful performances to meet all age groups. Now, the reason this is an important event to the community is that it's an evening that most people associate with um, drinking or maybe drugs. And what we are is an alcohol free, <coughs> drug free event, which is what the standard of the first night is, where we are showing our children that you can come and enjoy yourself and have a wonderful celebration without adding any of those substances. So it is a, a family-friendly entertainment, and, then, and there are venues all over town. We, um, we, we want to, and, and the challenge is that because we deal with families, and we deal with adults, and we deal with teens, the challenge is always to find the, the performances that people want to attend. So you have to have, we have venues that are just for the children. We have the Toke, Toke Bowl, which is the teen center for the teens. And we have other venues that are for the adults. But all venues are family friendly. We, um, we have to make sure if we ever hire again a comedian that he has to be, you know, not of color, things like that. We keep it toned in so that any, you know, you can take your children just about anywhere. Um, it's been, a wonderful partnership with Weston from the beginning because it was formed, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't involved in the very beginning. I, I came in probably two, probably two years after it started, um, where there was a residence of West of Weston and Westport came together to develop and, and and create this this event. So it's always been this link, and many of our performers come from Weston. Um, many of our volunteers come from Weston. And we had um, a period of time where the you're, you stopped, you were a big funder of ours. It was wonderful. You could depend on, on, on your resources. And then there was a period of a few years where we weren't getting any funding. Um, 
last year was the first year you came back and started to fund the event again, which was very exciting. And because I felt that we had this, this wonderful tie and link. Um, we have a program called the Button Giveaway Program, which we give buttons away to families uh, in need, and we, they're defined by the Human Services Department. And last year, you know, because Weston was back with us, we were able to do that to the families here. And basically it is, you tell us what you need and we give you the buttons. Do we know approximately how many? I, you know, I was just trying to, I had a senior, I don't, I think it was 50. 50 I, from Weston? I That's think so, because I was remembering that, I, I was doing, I will have to check. It was definitely, it was, I think it's 50. That's fantastic. And so, uh, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I think I give 150. 100 or 150 in Westport. Whatever you needed, you know, it was basically I called your human services uh, person, I can't remember who it was, and I just said, What do you need? And she just told me to the button. So it, it, it's, it's a wonderful program because it gets, it gets people out that, that to enjoy something that they would normally not be able to afford. I have a question. Was it last year and it was in Westport because it was so intrigued by fireworks? Oh, yeah, there was. Um, it wasn't fireworks, it was... It was fireworks. It was fireworks? Yeah. yeah. And it was, it, it was absolutely no Well, that's because we were on the other side of the river. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, it wasn't fireworks. They fell into the river. This, the, this father right. was yeah. watching his child, oh. and she fell into the river. In January? First well, there's been that yeah. long, we also had fireworks. But I don't remember. We had a father along the library, you know, the, the river is right next to the library, and all the people lined up there for fireworks as a, as a, at the end of the evening. And we never had anybody fall into the river. Sorry, of uh, This little girl fell in the river, and she wasn't hurt, but she said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm in the river. And he dove, he dove in and he dove right on a rock. Yeah, he got it. No, I don't remember the fireworks or anyone because we're doing them in the middle of the river. They're, they're on a barge now, so they're, and they're low. I don't remember anyone getting injured with the fireworks. I just remember that we were on the other side uh, of the river watching the fireworks last year, so I didn't see the event where the child fell in. I wasn't, I wasn't there, but um, the, I don't remember the fireworks you yeah, because they, unusual. Yeah, no, it isn't. But we, these are ground effects fireworks. We're um, we're very when the, when the the new Levin Pavilion opened, we were um, we were told we could no longer have the traditional fireworks that were really high up in the sky because the embers could burn down the level. So we were told we needed what's called ground effects fireworks, and they're lower to the ground, and we had to put them out in the river. And the barge. So of course, the, the cost of the fireworks went up by two thousand dollars to get the barge. But the the ground effects are absolutely gorgeous because you're, it, they they're just like the ones in the sky, but they're closer and they're, they're, it's it's a magnificent experience. And I was very excited by it, and and um, I think the the people really enjoyed it. And but the problem we we had last year is that we can only get the barge in the river during high tide. <laughs> and, and the tide was low when we would normally shoot the fireworks, which is at the end of the event at 10 o'clock. And I was afraid that we were going to have to shoot them early in the evening, and then all of these performers that I had paid, you know, that I promised to pay, and you know, people would come to the fireworks and then leave the event. But it turned out very well. People came to the fireworks around 7.30, and then they returned to the event. And I thought, oh, thank God, because I didn't want all these performers who have no one in their audience to entertain. So it worked out very well. I think parents um, enjoyed the fact that their children were up to see the fireworks. And now I look at the tide chart, and of course the tide is now high at 10 o'clock at night. So I don't know. I have to talk to the fireworks people to see when we can get the barge in the river. But that's, um, that, that, it, that was, uh, you know, Unfortunately, last year we did have that, that problem with the child. But you have to watch your children. Anyway. Well, you volunteered last year. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and what you have to understand is not one person that puts this whole event together gets one cent. Every cent 
goes to the event, every cent. And that's what makes it pretty interesting. And it's such, you know, it's such a happy time. I mean, there's so many things in, in life that, that aren't. And this is an event that brings the community together in a in such a celebratory way. And it, it's it's so uplifting. And you need that. And, and basically it was safe. People were not driving, they were not there was no drinking, there was no drugs. The kids were having a good time. And, uh, it was it was a, it felt like a very it, safe event. It did. And and it's um uh, you know sometimes I you know I because I am involved in so many other activities that involve uh, the other nonprofits, and you think, well, you, but you have to balance. You know, you can you can do both. You can care and do and give to other things as well as bring a community together in a moment that is starting. You know, New Year's Eve is the beginning of the new. Of, uh, you know, a new slate. You bring everyone together to start at the beginning, and it, it just it, it's 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 magical. And the the evenings that you have a little snow coming down and the horse drawn buggies going around town, it's it's so New England. It's so beautiful. It's it's such an inviting place to be. All right. And we are we traditionally have supported. You always supported it until um, I guess the administration before you stopped supporting it, and then in the last term they did, you know, and then you came back. But it was always from the beginning. It was that always a uh, I don't want to do anything unprecedented in this case, so I would say by the same token as with the um, Homes with Hope, we should perhaps entertain the idea of a budget allowance of a, a, a similar a por a proportional support this year, given that our budget is Yeah, I understand that. I know that. that I had talked to Tom about that on the phone. 60%. 60%. Um, uh, they, they got significantly less. We actually had money left over in that account last year, which was part of the reason for the reduction. And typically there are four or five organizations that have received money, some cultural, some social services. But by, by the precedent we just said, 60% of the last year's thousand would be about 600. Which we wish we more. I know, so more. <laughs> Kinetic is going to turn. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and, again, and again, I think that um, money does not make all the difference in terms of whether people have a good time or not. They feel safe, they feel like a broader way um, amongst us, that, that is what we support. Oh, it's supporting. And I think it is a good amount of money that's going to make that happen. Oh. So we'll be there. Okay. And we'll, we'll have to take behind as much of a, um, a cordial and fun evening as, as I have to do. Okay. Last, last I have to say, I know I have a big job ahead of me, and I have to figure out the performers I want. <laughs> okay, so we're saying now $600? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, would one of the gentlemen like to I move to allocate from funds from the fiscal year 2000. 16, 17 community grants won at the first night Westport Weston for the amount of $600. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. We're good. Good Thank to go. Very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're now up to number five on the uh, agenda. Sure. Well, I, I hope I hope it'll be uh, you, you guys will uh, comment and contribute as, as you wish. But I can start off. Um, so the, the strategic planning committee uh, was established um, about nine months ago. It has a two-year term. The mission is to uh, bring together a group of um, residents to. Uh, make recommendations to the Board of Selectmen on ways to uh, achieve the strategic goals of the community, which includes um, uh, having the appropriate amenities, having a welcoming environment, serving all the residents, um, all within fiscal uh, constraints, 
Um, and um, the, the objective or the means to do that is really a combination of gathering information on our strengths and weaknesses, putting together a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, really understanding what the community is all about, um, what attracts people to Weston, uh, what factors about Weston uh, make it uh, more difficult to attract people, um, and to do some really um, thorough data gathering on what those issues are and how we could improve, um, how we can change with the times, given the change in demographics and changing uh, preferences on the part of residents and future residents. Um, and develop recommendations uh, for the Board of Selectmen to consider, uh, all in um, conjunction with the Planning and Zoning Commission, which has an extremely important, uh, well, the primary role um, in planning uh, for the town uh, through its uh, planning um, element, uh, including its um, at least uh, every 10 year planning uh, report. So um, we have uh, 15 members. Uh, we uh, are co-chaired by myself and Jane Connolly of uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and um, we have divided ourselves into three, sub three primary subcommittees, one uh, which is, uh, whose mission is to think about um, marketing and communications around the town. Um, the second is to think about um, uh, future residents and, and young families. And the third is to think about uh, more long-term residents and seniors. Um, and we work uh, collaboratively. We have separate meetings of our subcommittees as well as meetings of the full committee. Um, and um, I would say, I would describe the first nine months as primarily a data gathering stage. There was a strong feeling among the commission, the committee, that uh, we really shouldn't um, do anything without having a full understanding of what, um, what the town's demographics were, future demographics, demographic changes, future expectations on, on changes in demographics and preferences, et cetera. Um, so we've spent a lot of the time gathering data and also trying to come up with some uh, what we call quick wins, in other words, ways to improve the town um, that, are, that are quick and easy um, or that can be done without, without a great deal of investment um, and, and which, which um, are generally viewed as positives for the town. Um, and I'll come to what those are very briefly in a second. The second phase, which is going to start on September 7th with our next meeting, is the strategic phase, where we've gathered our information and now we're going to um, identify key priorities uh, to study. Um, so going back to the first nine months, I think that the, some of the, we've, we've done, I think the committees have done a fabulous job um, looking at different um, ways to improve the community and, and coming up with ideas. Uh, some, of the, some of them, there, there are many, uh, have been already implemented. One of them, uh, which, which um, is really great, is the Ambassadors Program, which um, many of you may not know of, but um, it's a great program which um, consists of a group of Western ambassadors who have committed to work with real estate agents in town to uh, basically explain to future and potential residents what the town is like, what the benefits are, uh, to explain, you know, philosophy, the, the small town, sophisticated town, which um, is quiet but is very close to um, everything you need, uh, has the beauty and rural atmosphere, but, but uh, close to amenities. Um, and the, you know, just the very the community community orientation, the charitableness, um, and the, the great the great what what we've come to call the West and Way. Um, and they've been you know going around with with real estate agents and and uh, really introducing Weston to people who don't know a lot about it. Um, a second initiative is a website uh, called the West and Way, which has been 
developed by some of our really talented uh, digital online uh, gurus, um, which um, will be up and running and is just a terrific um, way for people who are, who are shopping for a new home uh, can learn more about Weston uh, beyond, beyond the town website and the school website. Um, so a third one is, is um, the Weston Business Initiative. One of the things we know about the town is there are a very high proportion of entrepreneurs and um, home businesses in town and bringing those folks together and, and, and presenting Weston as a uh, home business friendly town is really an important part of, of who, we, who we think we should be uh, going forward. Um, so those are just a couple, there, there are many more, uh, but it's been exciting to implement those. And then um, for the, the next phase, which starts on September 7th, uh, we're going to have uh, a limited number of priorities that we're going to study. Uh, right now we've got each of the subcommittees um, working with each other to develop a couple of priorities to study um, and to consider for rec ultimate recommendations to the, uh, to the Board of Selectmen. These are the big issues. Um, these are the issues like development in town, um, you know, developing more of a community atmosphere in town, um, things we can do for seniors, um, transportation issues, the bigger issues that um, you know the, com the committee would like to study, uh, work with the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, and ultimately make uh, recommendations to the Board of Select. Um, so that's um, that's a brief update. Have any questions? Happy to discuss them. I would like to just have to ask if you have any questions, someone in the audience yeah. might like to have an I, I, opportunity to ask. I can go on and on about this, you know, so I'm, I'm going to hold my fire uh, till, till the final day. You want to fire day. Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, maybe. Um, two things. One is, uh, you know, when you start collecting data and really diving into, into research, you, you usually have surprises, and I was wondering, in terms of this project, what would be the top positive and, and uh, I'll say negative surprises that have come out of the data gathering and informational uh, sort of uh, brainstorming sessions that, that, that has popped up that you didn't expect at the beginning of the project? Um, you know, I, I think the, um, probably the, I, I hate to say it, but the surprise that I had, um, one of them was, we expected that one of the, I'll start with the negatives and I'll come to the positives. Negative, the, the, um, the surprise I had was, was really how um, little people know about the town of West, uh, and how um, real estate agents uh, out who are outside of the town really don't know much about it, yeah. and, and it's, 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 it's a little more of a uh, hidden gem than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's, that's one of the things that, that struck us when we, we interviewed real estate agents, what they didn't know. Um, so we're, we're just not doing a good job communicating who we are. And that's, that's why, that, that's the first thing that gave rise to the investor program and the website and the sort of key to communicate. There's a big but though. We don't really want to be all that well known in Weston. We like the quietness of our community. We like the old fashioned quality of our history. Yeah, we're, 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 really not, we're not marketing the town as a, as a commodity. Well, no, we are, I, no, th my point That's is that. That's not our mission. No, no, no. My, okay. my, no. my point is that people don't even know that. They don't know that this is a place that you can come to. For they don't know there's anything to. above Westport. Right. Exactly. Even the real estate agents. <laughs> And the real estate agent, what they did, you found it and you said, oh, right. that's way out there. Right. That's no, they, they think we're like yeah. in, in, in Litchfield. I'm not going to drive up there. No, never. <laughs> and literally, many people in Weston are closer to the major arteries and the stores than parts of Westport. Yeah. Right, exactly. 
it's, it's stunning. Well, I think we better decide what we represent. And I think we, we do represent a certain kind of lifestyle. We represent a commitment to family values. We represent a commitment to preserving the best of the past. Uh, we represent a community that is cordial to each amongst ourselves. Uh, and we take, try to take care of each other. And if that's not, we have values. And I think we're a community that represents certain values. And I think that that's part of what our vision is all about. And the positive? Oh, uh, um, the, the, positive, the positive is, uh, and it's, it's kind of the corollary, how much people who are here really love it. Seriously, it's, it, it, is, it is overwhelmingly positive once you get once you find it. You have to get lost to find it, but once you get here, <laughs> that <laughs> one, that one, get lost and lost it. <laughs> and, and the other question I kind of had, you know, maybe the data is not all the, the way out there, but it, when the project started out, it sort of had a dual mandate. It was figure out, you know, what to do about the shrinking enrollment and the flat grant list. I know it's it's morphed from there. It looks like that the trajectory of that enrollment has bent somewhat, and I'm, I'm wondering what the actual data, because you guys were crunching it, what your impressions were about, you know, it, it looked pretty dire when this first started, and now I think somewhat less so, and I just would love your impression on it. Yeah, no, we, we had presentations from uh, Colleen Palmer uh, on that subject as we started, and um, as you say, um, I, think I think the committee was starting a little bit of a um, fear factor, um, and now I think we're, we're, we're moving ahead less on a fear factor and more on how can we be better. Yeah, recall, the, the first couple of meetings were like, let's define the problem, yeah. and now the language you're using is not problem, and that's a wonderful thing. Right. And we have a member of the Board of Education. Yep. <laughs> number one. No, number one, 35 in the country, right? Number one. And <laughs> number one in Connecticut. And more students arriving daily. Yep. Yeah. So those new numbers will be fed into you guys pretty soon. Yeah, that'll be very exciting. Actually, when, when will we have uh, so many good numbers? We're, we're kind of um, putting those together. October uh, so one is your is your state reporting, um, but we're we're facing some um, Increase. class increases that we're addressing right now. So. Well, we we uh, our committee would love to when whenever you you folks are ready to talk about this, okay. we'd love to have okay. you in and have another conversation. Okay. That, that's all I'll say for the interim. Okay. Thank you. I'm not fired. No. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> We're new, we'll even with <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Um, number six, dispatching decision to take property tax refunds as listed below for the total of $4,360.82. So moved. Uh, right, second, please. Second. We now have a discussion then. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Um, number Seven, discussion decision to approve the board selection minutes from June 30th, July 7th, 21st, and 28th. I'm, can we break out the first three from the last one? Yes, we can. So, do, are you in concurrence with that? Yes, okay. second. So, oh, so well, I'm sorry. Discussion you know, June 30th, yep. uh, minutes June 30th, July 7th, July 21st. I move to approve the Board of Selectmen minutes from July 30th, July 7th, and July 21st. Second. All in favor? Aye. And then unanimous. Now, the, um, we've broken this out as the um, special meeting for Board of Selectmen, the minutes of July 28th. Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the minutes of July 28th. Second. Then, uh, all in favor? All, all right. right. I have to abstain. You're going to abstain. I wasn't there. Uh, so I will not attest yes. to the contents of it. I will take your word for it. It was a great day as we were. I'm sure she did. You know what? When I'm gone, I'm sure there were balloons, there was cake. I know that. All right. Thank you very much. Now, the update. Secure, uh, and I assume that, Alan, you're here tonight for what uh, reason? I'm not sure. I'm going to be updated. I'm not sure what she didn't talk about. Oh, that's what, uh, I assume this is why you're here tonight. Yeah. For the update. I'm, no, I'm well, because it says security issues before school starts. I'm 
Yeah. No, I don't have any idea why that's on there. No, but I, I mean, that's the reason you're here tonight. I came to hear what it was about. Pardon? I came to hear what it was about. That's what I'm, I'm, it was a simple question. Yeah. Okay, so the issue about security before school starts is starts with the issue of road hazards, and I discussed this in the previous meeting. We're looking to try to make sure that the roads are safe for the buses. There are a few things that are particular concern that we're discussing, which was on the agenda as the first item that the Lomas was going to discuss, which is the Northfield tree issue. School buses, we have video. School buses have to go like that across the yellow line to get around that tree. And the, I'm surprised the Board of Ed has not brought this to the attention of the selectmen before because I think it looks just plain dangerous for our school children in the buses. Also for ordinary people driving it from either direction. It's almost a blind spot coming over the hill and then there's a tree that's abutting the road by uh, just a matter of feet, or less than feet. So we're looking at this in terms of the safety issue. So that's one of the things I'd like to clarify before school starts. Is, 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 the, the, police, is the police involved? The police involved now? They, they, have, they have verbally all agreed that there is a problem there with the safety. They've done a core assembly, and there is rot. Um, there, it, it's really a matter of what risk you want to talk about. Um, I'm not willing to, Did I have zero tolerance. Clearly, just looking Very at the tree in the bark, some people have had some encounters with it. Quite a few. Even the seniors drive the ride. Yeah. Van, just yeah I, I imagine if there are two vehicles and a jogger on the road, it's probably a pretty unpleasant situation. So, but it is a wonderful trip. So, so this is open to the discussion. What's the protocol there? Like well, actually, it is the it is the judgment of the tree warden. Not, that's who is not, not here tonight, um, and he is following through, doing a lot of research, and he is, uh, and I really welcome the public's input on this, but okay. it is basically in the hands of the tree warden to make a decision based on the information that you have. Yeah. Well, we went through this before. Okay. Would you like to identify yourself? Sure. My name is Joe Parsons. I live at a Northfield Farm Lane, which is the house next to the Yes. City. Okay. And so we had this debate before. You're talking about 20 years ago. 1998. No. Oh, yes. okay. 1998. 20, 18 years. Great. Right. Okay. So the discussion will probably will, will happen again when the tree warden comes to present to us, but right now he's not here. So um, I'm actually here to ask about the process, not the. Well, I, would, I and I would like to in, in, in turn to ask you about your your opinions on it. Well, I've lived there for over 10 years, and there's never been an accident. Are you, are, are you there on the on the road that comes out right where the tree is? Okay. First house. Okay. And I went by it today. There's no fresh damage to the tree. I have a picture of it. Like the tree. No, no, no fresh damage, but historical damage clearly is no, just great for sure. Um, this so I guess the question is how are we going to determine what risk we are taking? I mean, I can skip that discussion, but you're mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, the tree's probably as old as the town, right? It's not one tree, though, you understand. It's not a historic <clears throat> tree. It's four, four trunks, actually. I don't know if that's right. Yeah, we've, 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 we've determined that it's not quite what it purports to be. Well, um, I'm saying I don't know that that's relevant to the discussion, whether it's one or four trees. Um, you just said observing the best of the past is the, one of your key values. So that seems to be open to that. But I think the real question is, is it truly a problem or a problem? Is it a hazard? And is, have we had any experience that would demonstrate it's truly a problem? And I can say in 10 years, not to my knowledge, from first-hand experience. And then I think in 98, it was quite an outpouring of support, to say mildly. Yeah. As, as, and I felt in accord with that. Mm -hmm. I felt in accord with that at the time. For my part, I hope we have a vigorous discussion, both sides, and you know, hear, hear evidence in, in both directions. And I assume that's what we're going to do when we get tree work. Yeah, can I just say one thing, Margaret? Um, I, I, I agree with that. We should have a full discussion. I, it sounds like there are two issues, though. There is a there's a tree warden issue, which relates to the health of the tree, I assume. Yes. And then there's a, a traffic issue, 
which which I don't think Bill Lomas is really the person to analyze. Wouldn't wouldn't we want someone to help us with that as well? Well, where we have asked bus drivers, the school bus drivers, they have been pleading to do something about this, what they perceive as a hazard, and there is all the scarring on that tree, and without that sheet, sheet of, of uh, bark, that tree is its health is is definitely damaged. The bark is what protects, it's like the skin in our body. What would be the person that would be Dave, Dave, Dave Lusberg? Person to get to get a report from the bus drivers, collated. So I mean, sort of. Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's my understanding that the train warden has a, has addressed the transportation coordinator as well as the bus company. Okay. And in terms of deciding whether that tree is a hazard to our children, I don't think the board of ed's going to take a position on the tree. But I think the people who have to do transportation have been involved. So the, in so the, the tree warden's been in touch with them. So. I believe so. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I. I just from my own standpoint, I think we should have a vigorous discussion. I would like to hear from the neighbors. I'd like to hear from Mr. Lomas. I'd like to hear from somebody who has training in traffic, because I think that's, that's obviously part of the issue. There is one other issue, and that is that the report that was done back then, perhaps you will address this, at that time discussed a lot of these issues, said that to make it safer, there should have been mirrors put up, there should have been um, arrows and signs on either side of warning that there was going to be a road hazard ahead. None of the mitigation has ever been done. And if we had any kind of accident, the town's liability would be sky high. But not to mention some of the better. Yeah, I'm just talking about process. I'm not yeah. talking about the substance. I'm just saying I want to hear from somebody who's an expert who's looked at it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not an yes, expert on that. <laughs> However, I've been around longer than a whole lot of people writing columns about it. And um, so I, I decided that I would go back and look into this. I said, yeah, I wasn't on PNZ then. What had happened now, I recall, the planning zone approved the subdivision that you live in. And decided that in improving it, the sight line was not adequate. So they said you should take the tree down or make it adequate. Whatever. Unfortunately, the tree was not on the property of the subdivision. So it was up to the town to do it. So the town, the tree warden was dragged out to check it out, and he, <coughs> it and he said, Yes, the tree should go. And the next thing that happened was <clears throat> just like we agreed with it. And then I believe, I don't have the exact details, but I believe it was in here. I recall the, of the position of the Board of Select, you know, petitions went out, whatever, and they objected to the actions of the Board of Select. And as I recall, and others might recall otherwise, the, um, George was, I mean, Hal was here, he, he, he did he, 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 oh, I remember that, you know, but he left her. <laughs> so Hal and George were on the board selected. And George uh, eventually agreed to do something and save the tree. And so we moved. We, George, also, you still have the same kind of engineer who checked things out at the John Condi with the sight line. And we changed, the town spent money to change, to change these, the, the road, Northfield Road, so that you had a slightly better sight line. And if they didn't do the details, of these other things you're mentioning, that was, but they redid the road. They, they, it was uh, quite something over a tree. We, we have this thing about trees, and a few years later we did something else with other trees and you know, whatever. But that's the story of that. Hmm. And the main problem was the PNC never should have approved what they did. Many times, many of the things that happened is because of the oh. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't on PNC. Uh, but the uh, many things that happen, you have to do it within the property. You can't start doing things outside the property because what happened was that it was an approved subdivision, and the town was going to get sued if they didn't let him do it. It was a condition of approval by planning and zoning yeah. to remove the tree. Yeah, but they and, and the uh, tree warden 
concurred, and then there was you know, a request for hearing or you know, revolt or kickback, whatever you want to call it. The, uh, the first selectman, who was George Cadera, uh, then got involved. This is all in the record. I only know this because I pulled this out for Bill a month ago or so and looked at it at the time. And uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission then reversed itself as a condition because George, in a letter, he identified these things that the town would do. I don't know if they were done, if some of them were done, if they were done, but you know, only done once, not done again, like you know, get a paint a line on a road, probably it's not gonna last 20 years, you're gonna have to keep that up. So I, I wasn't here, I don't know what was done, what wasn't done. But anyway, they reversed them, they, they took that condition of approval out of the subdivision approval. The tree warden then held a hearing and he, reversed himself, the tree could stay with the town representing that it was going to do these things, who knows what was done. In terms of the process, uh, some, someone was talking about the process. If the tree warden, the tree warden can determine dead tree, immediate hazard coming down, dark at night, he can do that. He's not going to do that on this tree, okay? He's a little, you know, he's a little more put together than that. There are certain trees that you would do that and it would be perfectly legitimate. This is not one of those trees. So I know because he's told me a little bit about what he's gone through and he's talked to the police department about you know, whether it's a safety aspect, he's talked to the power companies, talked to the bus company, he's talked to several people. He's still in the process of developing that. He will, if he determines, he's had some sort of tree done on the structural integrity of the, or test done on the structural integrity of the tree or the leader that's over the road or something. At some point, that one that sticks way up is actually bolted to some other part of the tree that's actually broken. They, you that, need to when it's got that many on. So if he determines, gee, that tree's got to come down, he'll put a big placard on it that says, deemed to be you know, executed by the tree board. If you have a, a problem with that, call me. You can demand a hearing, bango, you be sure you'll get one. You can be assured you'll get that vigorous discussion you want back and forth, and then a decision will be made. But it's his, it's not yours. So it's it's makes, a free word decision. Yes, he's authorized, and I'm authorized to authorize him. So he makes a decision, and who can appeal it? The town. Anybody. All and right. who do they appeal it to? Him. They appeal it to him. Yeah, he, he's the guy who has the statutory power. Yeah, he can't go, every, every tree decision can't have to be pushed up to a higher authority. Now this, this is an important tree, so I think he's, we're hearing he's gonna be sensitive enough to not do anything without everybody being fully aware and appraised, but. But I'm just talking about the constitutional rights here. Does the, why did the Board of Selectmen take a vote the last time if, if it's the tree board? The Board of Selectmen did not take a vote. I, I, I said correctly. Okay, okay. Yeah. The Planning and Zoning Commission did yeah. at a separate day. And then George said, oh, here, the town will, will do these things, you know, and sort of, maybe they did vote for him to go forward. But that's, that was not the controlling decision. It was still then Planning and Zoning, and then the tree board had gotcha. to reverse him, so, okay. so uh, which, which he did. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure all of that, was, I don't know the timing of it, but, you know, I'm sure there'll be some, you know, real entertainment value to the spectacle and a decision will be made so then I presume it's like everything else he still then makes the decision if the town or anybody is aggrieved I suppose you can take it to court I mean I, you know I don't know but it's not some other town body that then gets involved that's not how it works so you're off the hook good <laughs> <laughs> so that that will happen, but he's not. His report apparently is not ready yet. His report is not ready. So That's now, why he's not here. That's why we first right. But but that hearing is a separate. It's not a board of selectmen's hearing. No. It's not at a board of selectmen's meeting. You know, right. So I'm just saying. The process is there would have to be. I believe there would have to be a petition even to have a hearing. But his his assessment of the issue after doing due diligence is the is the final say. How, by the way, by the way as I understand it, one more thing is I think it's on town property, it's not on private property. Yeah. Agreed. But that doesn't change people's opinions. Now, I have to ask you that when, you, when you come out from there, I sometimes find it very difficult to see a car coming down. I think the beauty of that majestic tree outweighs by a million miles having one twice when I turn it. It's not a matter of looking twice. 
It's in my pictures. I do it at least five times a day. But you've not been hit, but I'm saying when I drive there, I don't always see whether a car is coming out there or how far out it is. I, I think we're talking semantics and a matter of opinion. And I'm not arguing that the tree doesn't impede on the traffic. I'm asking what is more valuable. A person's life. And I think there's lots of other ways of mitigating that risk. There, there could be several of the things you've said that should have been done that weren't done. That's correct. As an example. That's why I mentioned. That's neither you nor I. You know, we can go back and do those things. There could be uh, enforcement of the speed, uh, miles per hour. It's not enforced on that street. I can guarantee you that. I mean, most almost been hit by people at excessive speeds. So there's lots of other violations that are also creating danger, not just the tree, that could be mitigated. We could use speed reducing homes. We could do a lot of different things to preserve the tree. Um, so again, I was here to hear what the opinion was and what the process was. There's one other thing that I understand that from the point of view of the fiscal consequences, apart from safety and the value of the trade and so forth, uh, it would cost the town about as much to do the cables and all the remediation you're talking about, or more. And it would, it would not necessarily, it would probably not extend the life of the tree or improve the safety necessarily. Because the tree is different from what it was 20 years ago. <coughs>
one party to the other in accordance with Article 2.21. And it's just making it possible for the communications between the state and the municipality to proceed without having the point of hamstringing any effort to get improved service to the community. And, um, so it, that's my interpretation. It, it looks like what, what it's saying, I'm, I'm, again, I'm skimming through this now, is that we are going to like be responsible for making sure that it, it conforms with the Brooks Act, administration, engineering, design, and really service contracts, things like that. And we're not going to necessarily have to go through the process. Uh, and again, you know, this isn't my, my fourth, fourth day in any way, so I'm, I'm just trying to as quickly as possible why, understand this. This is why I think that an attorney, and this is a uh, well, Pat, you didn't get before. Pat has signed up. Pat yeah, has signed I, I up for this. I, I don't think you can act on this tonight. I mean, it just showed up, so I'm not familiar with like 60 pages or something. Typically, when we do a project for which we get state funding, like Pent Road, or right, Godfrey Road was, we end up signing you know, an agreement like this. You end up passing a resolution. There's like all kinds of things that get done. My guess is it's do it once and don't do it every time. So saying, and that the requirements in here are the requirements that are in those individual projects. But I don't know that. I mean, that's just a streamlined process. Some of the stuff looks familiar to me on, on first glance. I'm guessing that's well, the technology. I, I, I couldn't tell time. you that for certain. Well, this is not a situation in which I was necessarily going to sign it and act upon it. But it is a situation, when I'm looking at the data situation on 357, it was my expectation that if I am able to be authorized to sign this, I'm going to put it in a call to register. I don't think this has anything to do with 57. That's a state road, that's a state project. But well, we have no say over that. that. I think this is about projects that we do on roads that we're responsible to maintain for which the state is participating in the cost. That's, that, that's, a, that's what I think oh, is going on. It's not going to relate to... to we, 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 have, we had that project... That I road would, you know, would be just like the bridge down by Cobbs Mill, you know, last year the year before. It's a state road, it's a state it's project. The state you know, we, we really have nothing to do this with it. This is the State of Connecticut Department of Transportation. They began work on Route 57. I got no notification of what the act... I did not see an engineer's report that it was needed, that work. And you still won't, I don't think, if you sign. I don't think that's what this document is about. I think this document is about worked on on a town road, not a state road, that the state is participating. We need to look at it. Because it I, might mean, okay. but, I mean, I have to actually read the thing, yeah, but I mean, I think it's Yeah, because yeah, I'm seeing a lot of like insurance so clauses. Just, in if it does problem. not protect us from what's going on on Route 57 as a state road, road, I assume this is not just a municipal road. You could still bug them about it. <laughs> Feel free to bug them about it. What does it say that it's just, maybe just local roads? Where does it say that it's just you, local you roads? You can where else local roads, it says. Whereas the municipality undertakes municipal projects, the, the Route 57 is not project municipal is not a municipal project. Yeah, it's see, project. It, it's, it's helping us locally uh, maintain roadway yeah. structures and transportation. So facilities. we're going to want to ask that. We're going to want so to make it. No, that's right. That, that's uh, as, as I said, a lot of this looks familiar. We, we, we do it yeah, every time. We do state a big project. Guessing it's one is done. Not sure. As long as it doesn't require us to yeah, pre-determine pre 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 that we bought Tom a chance. chance to read it and then come back the next time and get a recommendation. Absolutely. And maybe we can make suggestions and broaden it to not be limited to municipal well, I, I don't know if they would go to You're going to have to their, their, their form is one size fits all. If you don't like it, we don't give you the money. Have a nice life. Okay? That's, that's how Connecticut DOT works. That may be the way it's worked in the past, but that may not be the way that it should be working. And I don't see any reason why not to ask them to allow us to have more say in what they do on the state roads if we, the people, are driving in and we find it a dangerous situation. I have hope that this Feel is free. going to help correct that. Yeah. Feel free. That's not what this is about. That's not what it was. In my mind, I thought it was. Okay. All right. Very good. We'll come back to that at another time. We will, however, pursue it. Okay, um, we now need a motion to go into executive session, town administrative recruitment process. I move to enter into executive session to discuss the town administrator, administrator recruitment process. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. And uh, we will come back 
perhaps to adjourn, or if there's nobody here, we will simply adjourn the executive session and say goodnight.